like to thank you guys for coming here today. We're going to talk a little bit about cyber careers and what uh, cyber means. Uh, we've got Kevin McPeak here. Kevin McPeak from Symantec. Kevin is the security and mobility architect focused on the U.S. government customers. Kevin and I used to work together when I was at Symantec. I'm over at Cisco now. But, uh, Kevin is a brilliant person and great to have here. He's got two master's degrees. One from, I always have to look up my notes, one from John Hopkins University, the other from Virginia Tech. He's currently a part-time PhD candidate at Virginia Tech, Northern Virginia Extension Campus. Um, Kevin's worked out throughout the different government uh, contractors through the years. He's a brilliant guy. He's also, I'm proud to say, an Army Reservist. He uh, is a Chief Warrant Officer and has deployed several times in uh, support of our nation. Um, before we get into this, I'm going to start a little video, kind of tell us what's kind of why cyber is important and what's going on. But first of all, can we have a hand for Mr. McPeak? The cyber world is the wild, wild west. Hackers use personal accounts to attack hundreds of new targets. Every second of the of the day, people are using a cyber attack. It gives criminals new openings to steal personal data and intellectual property. Cyber attackers are more sophisticated than ever, using advanced tools to get inside more networks, faster than most businesses can defend against. Advanced attackers targeted five out of six large companies in 2014 a startling 40% increase from the year before, and they're more deceptive than ever. In 2014, we saw them hijack companies and use their own networks against them. Once inside the breach network, they leveraged existing IT management tools to move stolen IP around. Others created custom attack software that they deployed from the victim's own servers, and many used stolen email accounts to spearfish the next victim. In 2014, there were 24 critical or zero-day vulnerabilities discovered. We saw cyber attackers exploit these holes much faster than vendors could create and roll out patches. The top five zero-days left companies without a patch for 295 days. From data centers to desktops, companies of all sizes are seeing an increase in cyber attacks. Nearly one million new pieces of malware are released every single day. In 2014, 28% of it used various tricks to avoid detection in virtual machine environments. None of us are immune. In 2014, we saw a 70% increase in scams shared by our own friends on social media. Roughly one in six Android apps turned out to be malware in disguise. On top of that, digital extortion is also on the rise. 45 times more people had their devices held hostage in 2014. Together, let's make 2015 a better year for digital security. Download Symantec's 2015 Internet Security Threat Report, and together we can increase your cybersecurity knowledge and outsmart the attackers. Semantics architect uh, for federal government. I also do some things in cross public sector, so state and local government, uh, education, which is both kindergarten through 12th grade, higher ed, as well as uh, healthcare sector. So, here today to talk to uh, students here, a lot of young people, about their career and you know why I think it may be a good idea to take a good hard look at having a career in cybersecurity. Um, you know, it's an interesting, uh, there's a, a Chinese blessing, it's also a blessing as, as well as being a curse, that says, may you live in interesting times. You know, if you think back in, in human history, there's those periods of time where there's just not a lot of changes occurring, and, you know, people can live kind of humdrum, boring lives, but then there's times when there's a great deal of upheaval, ma major changes going on. That can be a good thing, very interesting life, very interesting things. It could also be very bad as well. Um, you know, if you think about, Going back to like uh, 5000 BC, uh, you had you did have you know the beginning of uh, city states building with the pyramids in, in in what is now modern day Egypt, and 
you know, different things, but to a large degree it was an agricultural society. You saw the rises of uh, things like, you know, the formation of China as a nation state, uh, the great empires that covered India, the Roman Empire, and then, you, you know, some of these things uh, over time would, would change the rise of Islamic civilization. But then you had the Renaissance leading to the Industrial Revolution, and you had the advent of all of the, you know, manufacturing, and, you know, here in the United States, part of our uh, story of our nation's independence revolved to some degree around the textile industry. That was the cutting edge technology of the day um, when, you know, in, in, in Great Britain they had textile mills and they were using state of the art to make fabrics and clothing, mass produced things. And a lot of technology was actually kind of stolen by, you know, think about insider threat. Some of the <coughs> blueprints and methodologies found their way to New England and jump started our industrial base as a, as a nation. Um, so what you're seeing in, in, in the uh, time span of my lifetime is this prodigious growth of information technology. <clears throat> and those that are really in the know uh, do a lot of discussion around uh, what's called Internet of Things, or as, as Leon and I were discussing at lunch today, Internet of Everything. But you know, I'll use the acronym IOT. <coughs> so like currently on my physical person, um, I have two cell phones right now. I have an iPhone, I have an Android. And that's the only network addressable devices on me right now. Fast forward, even as soon as five years, people will have computer technology embedded perhaps in their glasses, in your belts, uh, you know, just all different things. If you think about from even the human body, there's now technology specific to like insulin pumps, uh, you know, monitoring blood pressure, blood glucose levels, pacemakers, hearing technology. Um, I had one a coworker the other day, uh, he wears a hearing aid and he didn't have any uh, Bluetooth devices, anything on, but he was having a conversation. And I, I'm looking, I'm like, he has no headset. And then he explained to me, he was on a call, but Bluetooth was integrated with his hearing aid. I thought, isn't that, you know, it's a shame that he has hearing issues, but isn't that cool that he's able to, you know, leverage what at one point was, gee, I have, you know, hearing loss, but now it's like, it's actually a technological advantage for him. So, um, but all of these things, all of these uh, computing devices, network addressable devices, they all have a cybersecurity dimension. I think of even in my lifetime buying automobiles. The first car that I, and some of you as students are either studying, getting ready, you know, thinking about going to get driver's licenses, or perhaps you're already started that process. But you know, it's exciting at that age to you know, say, hey, I'm going to be out there driving. So I remember my first car, uh, the entire automobile had, it was all mechanical. There was no computer, anything on it. There was no software, no hardware, no firmware to worry about updating or securing. Uh, and then I remember seeing high-end cars come out in the marketplace, and those had onboard technical systems, they had software that ran, they had things when you brought it to the uh, mechanic, could actually update the software, but that was for the, the very expensive automobiles. In today's market, even in developing countries around the world, anybody that gets a, a new vehicle, even a, like a, a, a lower-end four-cylinder vehicle, it's going to have multiple computer systems, things that communicate uh, through wireless uh, networks, updates, uh, you know, telemetry about how the vehicle is performing, things that the mechanic will actually log into. But think about the cyber concerns around that. Think about things like weather reporting. Imagine if a, um, a um, let's say a bad storm or tornado was, you know, ripping across North Texas, something like that, Oklahoma. All these technical systems, things associated with emergency first response, lights, the, the traffic lights, industrial controls, wastewater treatment, energy sector, telecommunications, U.S. federal government, state local government, and, and then manufacturing activities. Each one of these uh, important endeavors in our nation that, that you could be looking at have a cyber defensive component because anything that's on the network, that's, that's network addressable, that's communicating files, that's allowing downloads, that's doing uploads, gives a chance for our nation's adversaries to sort of uh, mess around with the confidentiality, integrity, uh, or, av or availability, or some combination of those three, of those systems. And you know, going back to that uh, Chinese thing about the interesting times, well, you know, it's both a blessing and a curse, right? So if these systems were, let's say, attacked uh, simultaneously, could cause pretty catastrophic consequences uh, to, to, our, to our nation and, and to our economy. Um, you know, also think about it, you know, right now we're in an interesting time with the upcoming presidential election, we're in the primary season. We just saw you know, pretty interesting uh, events occurring in Iowa, you know, we're about to hit New Hampshire. 
And America seems divided right now, but the one thing that I think as Americans we all can agree on um, is that we don't want, let's say for example, the governments of Russia, China, uh, North Korea, Iran, or various you know, amorphous groups like the anonymous actors. Uh, we don't want them mucking around with U.S. government or, or U.S. Cor corporate entities getting inside, manipulating data, causing system outages, compromising uh, personal information, medical information, your, your credit scores, all these sorts of things. So that's, that's the one area where you, know, you could be a, um, a Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders supporter, you could be a, a, you know, Donald Trump, a Ted Cruz, or Marco Rubio type of supporter. It doesn't matter, we're all on Team America. So when it comes to defending our infrastructure, it's something I think we can, we can all and should all agree on. So you know, we're hearing all these, these breaking cyber stories, all these things that are, are going on. And I'm thinking about, well, gee, if I were a young person, would I want to work, work in this career field? And I'll make an analogy to driving. I mentioned you know, automotive technology earlier. But thinking about, um, in the United States, their speed limits are posted pretty much everywhere. So I think here, like on the high school in the parking lot, there's, I'm guessing, Leon perhaps help me out, but there's probably a few signs that says five miles an hour, 10 miles an hour, et cetera. Yes. You go out in the main roads that are close to the school, say, if school's in session, you know, 15 miles or what have you. Go out through some of the neighborhoods that might be posted at 20, 25. Bigger roads might say, but they have lights, they might say 40. You get on highways like 66, 495, what have you. You know, speed limit 55. You get out to, go out to uh, rural uh, Wyoming and places, big, wide, straight roads cut through. Some of them might have speed limits up to 85 miles an hour. But nowhere in the U.S. is it legal, I don't think, to go beyond 85 miles an hour. Contrast that, we'll talk a little bit about cultures, too, and how they impact uh, cyber. But go to a place like Europe, especially Germany. Go on the Autobahn. Um, the gentlemen and the ladies over there, they take their driving very seriously, much more than we do. They buy special gloves with special leather for the fingertip control. Um, they're very, they don't talk, they don't listen to music, they're certainly not texting. But they get on the Autobahn, they can go as fast as their vehicle uh, permits. So if they have a high end, let's say like a Lamborghini, they might be going over 200 miles an hour. And I remember, the, uh, so when I go to Europe, I don't drive. I make sure I have somebody drive me because I don't even know how to operate a vehicle at that speed. I would simply just get in a wreck. Uh, but I remember speaking with one of my uh, European colleagues, and, and he said, um, Kevin, when you're in the U.S. and you're driving, you are driving. But when you're on the Autobahn, you're really not driving your car at 200 miles an hour, you're aiming it. So I think for the, um, the students here, your career, okay, is the same thing. So let's say you pick an industry that is, uh, you know, well-respected, <coughs> professional industry, get a lot of respect in the community uh, for your whole career, but let's say it's something that's very mature. It's not fast-breaking um, like cyber. So, <coughs> for example, let's say you decide you want to be a dentist. That's certainly a respectable profession. I know for myself, if I do dental care, I want, you know, top-rate dentist, and, and people call them doctor, and, and they get a lot of respect in the community. And there are barriers of entry to become a dentist. You have to get your bachelor's. You have to go on and get your, um, your graduate studies to get that doctorate in dentistry. Then you have to use to take out big loans, open a practice, or else join a practice and take a salary. But you're building up your reputation, your clientele. And you have to be an expert of everything associated with the human mouth. Teeth, gums, lips, all that sort of thing. Uh, what's going on under, under, the, under the gums and looking for decay and things. And as a professional dentist, you would, every year, uh, perhaps you'd go to some conferences, learning about new dental technologies. You would read some publications. You would check the news. But, that, but the extent of learning, once you're validated as a dentist and you're in the practice, the, the cadence of learning, it, it does slow down because it's, there's only so much to know about the, the human mouth. Um, but like Leon showed the video <coughs> from the Semantic ISTR, the Internet Security Threat Report, that is an annual publication that Symantec puts out. Other uh, large corporations put out similar reports, and I encourage everybody to download these reports, read them, and be smart on them. Even if you're not going to be a cybersecurity practitioner, living in the modern age, it's good to be cyber savvy, cyber aware. So these are things worth reading. But I will tell you, in my personal life, my cadence for studying and learning, breaking things in the cybersecurity field, is a daily activity. So in the morning, there's certain uh, websites I go to, there's certain Twitter uh, feeds that I follow, and I rip through everything that's happened in the last 12 hours. I need that sort of, almost like think about like at the Pentagon, somebody comes on shift, or they're looking at, let's say, a certain region of the world. 
they're looking at that news cycle to say, what is, you know, I, I have expertise in my domain going back, you know, in time, but I need to know what happened just in the last few hours because things are, that are breaking that quickly. And then when, I, when I've done my work and I'm ready to you know, sort of wind down and, 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 and go home, I, I, I refresh my understanding as well. So compare something like that with dentistry. Dentistry may be you know, a few hours a year staying current, whereas cybersecurity, it, it, it's daily. Um, I remember even, I think it was as recently, if I'm not mistaken, as yesterday, uh, the Twitter feed for IBM Security, um, they came out and they said that uh, there's some talk about doing away with ATM cards. So what it is, is you do near field communication with your smartphone. You go up to the ATM machine and it would recognize you and then you, you, you'd use a second form factor authentication like a password. So something you have, your phone, and something you know, a pin, and you could actually get money out. But think about the cyber implications around mobile devices, mobile device malware, all these sorts of things. Could there be session hijacking so that somebody could spoof you and, and, and take that information? So the reason I, I point out all these different things, I'm just trying to get you kind of thinking about this, get a little uh, thirsty, so to speak, around, around cybersecurity as a profession. I'd like to mention another profession that just as cybersecurity, you need to develop some deep expertise and stay current and cutting edge. Also think about a profession like being a, a, a medical doctor, being an emergency room surgeon. So every time you get a new customer, and I hate to use that phrase in, in this, in this uh, conversation, but your customer is essentially your patient, right? So that person who you've never met before shows up and they're having the worst day of their life because they are in the emergency room, something has gone terribly wrong that they probably didn't anticipate that morning when they woke up, but they're there to go under anesthesia and you to fix something. So as a surgeon, you need all this professional training, you have to stay current and modern on, on, on the knowledge, right? And then you go in and you, you take a human being and you fix what ails them. You do the best you can to get them to the other side of coming out of anesthesia, and you've repaired or done your best to repair whatever has occurred, and you go home at night, you probably have a good sense of self-esteem, like, wow, that, you know, there's seven people today that I you know, saved their life, or I fixed the problem, or, or something even worse would have happened if they didn't get the treatment. But you certainly can have high self-esteem with that. The, the interesting thing with this cybersecurity profession is you have to be equally dedicated and, and smart about all these things. But let's say you do a customer engagement at, to, for cyber defense, and you're doing everything in your, in your professional capacity to help them get the right cyber hygiene, the right cyber posture, do all these things. And then you go home and you're lying in bed, you're like, did I remember this? <laughs> There's just so much, right? So you never quite feel done with it. And then even if you do have that sense of closure, like a surgeon, Let's say two weeks goes by and you read something, a new cyber event, uh, what I call TTP, tactic techniques and procedures of our, of our threat adversaries. Now they're attacking that industry sector in this way. And you're like, you know, I just briefed them on their cyber defense. And guess what? I never considered this new thing. So a lot of times you have to go back to your existing customers and kind of, you know, sort of re-advise them. So it is different. Being a surgeon, I think you do get a sense of closure. Um, if I have any doctors in here, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. But you know, if 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 you're in cyber, it's always a sort of uneasiness. So, um, but again, it does give you a great sense of reward, and it does certainly tie into that uh, the Chinese blessing and, and curse as well. Uh, so, so with with all that said, um, I know a lot of folks here are uh, their members of their family. If they're living here in Northern Virginia, a lot of people are, are intimately involved with U.S. federal government operations. A lot of national security things, especially uh, and, you know, living in the this is a great great part of our country. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how, the, let's say, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, how do they view the, the defense of the United States of America? <clears throat> so if you go back to the founding of our country, you know, Army generals and admirals, they would look at warfare on ground, so ground forces, and, you know, assessing the adversary's army and, you know, what artillery and, and, and archers and people with rifles and infantry and all that type of thing. And admirals and the people involved with the Navy are looking at ships at sea how to go out in harm's way in the ocean, uh, dealing with, with the, the natural elements of, of storms at sea, and also opposing nations, naval forces, what are their capacities, their weapon systems. And that became sort of like, for national security, the big thoughts. Of course, America is the land of technology and innovation. So two great engineers that are, are certainly can be heroes to all of us, 
Uh, Oliver and Wilbur Wright, they invented the air, airplanes, right? So now we add that dimension of, of, of space and air. And very quickly, that found its, it found its way into national security concerns with uh, Air Force and, and aviation, both offensive capabilities and, and defensive. Um, so then folks like the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they look at warfare. There's ground warfare. There's warfare on, 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 on the mm -hmm. oceans and, and, and at the sea. Naval warfare. I'm sorry? Naval warfare. Na and, I'm sorry, yeah. Na so, so ground, naval, and air. But now, if you listen to what comes out of the Pentagon planners and what they pu public press conferences, what they're teaching at military academies and, and, and advanced officer training and, and advanced NCO training, a lot of it, they, the fourth dimension is now cyber defense. So things like the, the backbone of the internet, uh, core infrastructures, data centers, cloud storage, endpoints, tactical endpoints, like uh, those internet of things, like there's a saying, every soldier is sensor uh, because they're embedding things on, on, on body armor or what have you. But all of these components, anything that, that can, can you know, quote, uh, I'll use the phrase write to disk or, or, or upload, download files, network addressable, becomes a component of warfare. So again, there's so many career choices. Uh, somebody could say, you know, I really have a passion for cars. I want to go into the automotive industry. I want to work for, let's say, Ford or, or one of those great companies. Could actually develop software and actually have, a, as a profession, the cybersecurity component of that. How many young people are going into that? So again, it's not driving your career, but sort of aiming it. That's one area to go. Uh, medical de de devices. Somebody mm -hmm. could decide to become a medical doctor and then develop on those embedded systems. Um, if you think about uh, former Vice President Dick Cheney, as he's gotten older, he required a pacemaker to be put in. And then as his body ages, they may need to recalibrate the, the, the heartbeat rhythm and things of that nature. So there's a way through wireless technology to communicate with the pacemaker and remodulate it and make adjustments. So what they, um, what our national security team started to consider was, if a hostile actor were to compromise that network connectivity and get close enough to, to Mr. Cheney, they could actually do a cyber assassination. And I remember being at one conference in Washington, D.C. It was um, a panel of government experts, and they talked about this idea of cyber murder. If somebody is on some of this uh, you know, embedded health systems, could somebody malicious actually kill them? And I remember the one representative said, how do we know it hasn't already happened? And that sent a chill up my spine when I heard that. But the whole idea is, if you had somebody who was in advanced stages of, of illness and, and late life, and they had some of these systems, if somebody actually was malicious and hacked into that and, and, and caused them to die, the autopsy could actually say, well, you know, the person had advanced stage, stages of, of various things in their life. It was natural causes. Not even doing the forensic analysis to say, could that pacemaker or some embedded system in their body have caused it? But in any event, what the decision was made with Mr. Cheney with his approval, they put him back under anesthesia. They went into his heart. They removed the, uh, the, 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 the unidirectional updatable uh, pacemaker, and they replaced it with an old school pacemaker that simply has a certain uh, functionality. And so then as he ages, if he needs adjustments, they'll just keep redoing the surgery because they felt it was too much of a cyber risk to Mr. Cheney's life, not only him as a human being, but to the reputation prestige of the United States. If an adversary could assassinate him, that would be you know, a big, big win, so to speak, for our adversaries. So rather than even run that risk, they've actually downgraded to a less technical type of, of pacemaker. Pretty amazing when you think about it, but there's just so many nooks and crannies and crevices. And I'll tell you, there's certain professions where um, the barriers to entry are low, the competitive pressures are great. We now have a global economy, we're open up to trade. So if you think about it, if you go to a certain career field where there's, uh, if you do like graduate level business courses, they talk about red ocean and blue ocean type business models. So red ocean, if you think about like <coughs> fish biting each other and attacking and churning and sharks and all, the ocean water with the blood gets red, right? So there's certain career fields you can go into. And you may have real passion, you may say, I enjoy this type of work, but your company that you work for, or if you start your own business, there's so much competitive pressure that um, the, the profit margins are razor thin. Some business quarters you may even lose money. So these companies are constantly trying to keep the labor costs down, wages down, and you can march forward and advance your whole career 
in that red ocean and, and fighting to, to, to get ahead and be successful. Um, the way I see cybersecurity is it, it's a really, for young people, it's a blue ocean career field because if you're willing to get smart on this and, and, and do the uh, undergraduate studies and get the bachelor's in the field and do some graduate work, some certifications, and stay current, you can go into any one of these little niche areas that I'm discussing, email security, internet of things security, medical, uh, you know, wastewater treatment, cyber, all these little things that, things that I'm not even touching or thinking of. Um, even like intellectual property. You know, look at what happened to Sony USA, a big compromise of their intellectual property. So many areas where there's a need for these types of professionals. You look at the company Target, um, they had their major breach. Somebody informed me, they said Target actually hired a CISO, a Chief Information Security Officer, uh, approximately like two years ago. So they, they, this co large corporation made it to a massive scale uh, you know, across our country. And they had various people with cyber responsibilities, but there wasn't that one man or woman that was, you know, that one belly button to push for the CEO or that one person to look at and say, have, you, have we really, as an organization, thought it through all the cyber defensive things we need to do? And of course you saw you know, the consequences were, were, were negative um, uh, for them. So you know, I'm trying to give the background here, why does, why does cybersecurity uh, matter? And the one thing I want to say is, I, I don't want you to think, gee, that guy Kevin from Semantic, he came here and he's talking about money. I will say full disclosure, I know people that are very wealthy and they're unhappy. And I know people that um, have low income, low savings, but they're happy with life. So, but I will say this just from my own anecdotal experience, Life goes a lot easier if you have good, good income and if you don't have to worry about losing your job. So certain industries, you know, if you get fired, it's no fault of your own, your company goes out of business, a competitor knocks you out. When you're out of work, it's tough. I remember, um, you know, growing up, my dad lost his job in, in, in the 70s and was out of work for like almost a year. And I remember like we would take orange juice and pour water in it because it was too expensive. So I think a lot of the young people, they haven't experienced that type of you know, poverty, but, but then my dad got a good job, started making good money again. So your life becomes sinusoidal where it's up and down. So for a career, if you're in cybersecurity, you're pretty much guaranteed, and you can live in any zip code in the country, you're going to be one of the high income earners, assuming you show up for work, have a good professional attitude, you're helpful, and, you know, respectful to your management customers. But, but, but this just shows some of the statistical data specific to the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area where we are. And the source of this is, um, what is the name of the company, right? Clearance jobs. So clearancejobs.com. So they, they do analysis oh, of, yeah. of salary. And you can see here, somebody who graduates from college, entry level, let's say they do computer science, or, they, or they've done another major, but they've taken computer classes, got some certifications. They get hired not as a cybersecurity practitioner, but simply somebody working in IT, uh, doing like administering of help desk, or email system, SharePoint, Linux administration. You, you can expect a, a salary um, of, uh, what, did I go ahead and slide? One more. I'm sorry. There you go. No. There we go. S uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. So $60,000 a year. If you talk to some of your peers that maybe want to major in something not related to uh, technology or computer science, ask them right out of college what types of income. And I, I would be very surprised if, you know, if it's more than 60000 Now, once somebody's working in that field and they're getting uh, proficient in understanding uh, you know, IT and system administration, they may develop a real passion for the, the cyber defensive side of it and go into being, let's say, working in a security operations center as a as SOC analyst. Uh, or being part of a team that does code review if you're developing applications internally. But something we're actually doing hands-on cyber work, you can see the, the big jump, a $30,000 jump, to become a security analyst. Of course, then there are a very interesting career profession is the idea of being a penetration tester. So a lot of times, uh, the folks I know that work in this field, what they do is on Monday morning, they go to the airport, they go to Dulles, and they fly. So they're part of a flyaway team. And they will meet at a customer's site either late in the afternoon on Monday or first thing Tuesday morning. And they'll go to a conference room and they'll talk with the team and they'll say, okay, this is the critical systems, critical data sets that are sort of the crown jewels of the organization that we need to protect. This is our existing um, 
infrastructure and, and controls that we have. So it becomes a discussion. And that, uh, that pen tester can get smart on the systems. And what they do is from outside of the organization, they will use all of the advanced hacking tools, technologies, things in their toolkits. And, and there's agreement signed saying that they're allowed to do this, so they don't get prosecuted, right? So their goal is to uh, compromise and to find out how far along they can get to sort of imbe embed in and, and do some disruptive things to the confidentiality <coughs> and the availability of the systems. They'll also typically do uh, targeted uh, spear phishing, uh, where they'll let, like for example, um, let's say I'm, I'm the pen tester and I call Leon and I say, you know, Leon, this is Herman McGillicuddy from um, the help desk and we're doing a, a software push, we're updating your desktop system. I need to know your username and password. And Leon's like, oh, well, Herman, thank you, yeah. So it's Leon.Davidson, okay. And my password's like password1234. Hey, Leon, thanks. So if you don't mind, just log off your system and, and I'm going to push up. Well, now I've got his credentials, so I could. So that's sort of like what a pen tester will do. They'll do social engineering. Um, they might send certain email attachments to see who clicks on a link to open up a website or opens up, a, let's say, a PDF attachment or something, even though it's not from a trusted source. So you're, you're doing these sort of things, and you're also being given some privileged accounts so you can sit there, sort of left seat, right seat, with one of the, um, the on-site engineers there, and you're running some tools to look for vulnerabilities within the systems. You're running scans to see what things they've hardened or not hardened within their server, their cloud environment, their endpoints, their, their desktops, their laptops, their mobile devices. You're doing this holistic look, and then at the end of the week on Friday, you do your outbreak, right? So you would actually come in, and you'd have this detailed report. Now, your engagement, depending on the size of the organization, it could be shorter than a full week. It could be you know, a few months if it's, if it's a large enough corporation. And you're usually part of a team. But just to give you an idea of pen testing, so average salary here in the, the, uh, the DC area, $122,000 a year. So that's, that's really nice. If you can make that kind of money, especially as a young person, it puts you on a whole trajectory of being able to save and invest or save money for down payment for a home. As you're starting your professional life, if you're making good money from a young age, and if you're, uh, you know, I'm sure you've all, you all seem smart like the whole idea of the power of compound interest. If somebody starts saving and investing when they're young, they're going to be so much ahead, let's say when they hit age 50, that if they wait to start saving and investing. If you start at, let's say, 25 versus starting at 30, it, 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 it sort of uh, widens the gap, and I encourage you to look into that. Bit. So really start thinking about it. So if you make a good income, again, money's not everything, but it can really make a huge difference in, in, in what type of lifestyle you have. So we see down here, security practice leader. So in, in a lot of organizations, they have a job title called a CISO, a Chief Information Security Officer. So that person is looking at the entire organization, not just like what the users are doing in the back end mail system, but looking at some other things that you may not even consider. Like, are there uh, embedded computer computing systems for the air conditioning, heating, ventilation systems? Do they have communications outbound? What about things associated with risk of supply chain management? Where are we buying our hardware and our <coughs> software? How are we getting our updates? How do we get not just software updates and patch updates uh, and new software installed? How do we push it? How do, we, how do we uninstall it if there's a vulnerability associated with it? it and, and even, like, how do, how do we evaluate it before we actually put it on our systems? So a CISO in, in the Washington, D.C. metro area, or, or these types of uh, security leadership, they will engage with the chief executive officer, the CEO, the CIO, the chief information officer, other executives and leadership. But look at that salary, $322,000 a year. And this source is from Indeed.com. So it's not... Kevin, you know, saying this or semantic. Uh, it's, it's coming from that. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I skipped a slide. I think you're okay. Yeah, so again, just showing all these different types of job titles, uh, looking at some statistical data, um, you know, on, on salaries and earnings. Over here. So we talked about the different types of uh, career progression. So you come in, let's say, as a system administrator, become an analyst, pen tester. Application security. Anybody who wants to have a great income and you want to learn how to actually do programming languages and tech, those types of technical systems, 
A lot of times it takes money to make money, so you have to go and take all these like software training courses, and some of those can be expensive. I do know that Google Corporation is really encouraging the uh, development of Android applications, so a lot of the Android software development platform <coughs> and the ability to have an emulator that actually looks like a, like a you know actually on, on your monitor will look like what you, what would render on your on your on your Android device on the screen, but actually allows you to have video training, all these things. A lot of this stuff is is free; it's publicly available. Um, even some other programming languages on YouTube, there's great training opportunities. So you could take classes during the day or, or evening, weekend classes, but also supplement with some of these less expensive or even free models to get proficient. And then, so the whole idea of developing software, but if you're an expert on troubleshooting, analyzing software for security issues, and that becomes your sort of niche professional calling, oh my gosh, you are definitely um, highly employable, could live anywhere you want in the US, probably work from home, make great money. I just, I can't say enough good things about that idea of being uh, you know, an application security architect. There's, there's tremendous, and then you're doing a good thing for society, right? You're helping make uh, you know, your fellow Americans and people around the world responsible people safe and secure in what they're doing with their computer. So it's a profession you can really feel good about too. To talk about that. It's definitely more than just a job. So that concludes my, my slide decks, but I'm definitely, um, oh man, I'm sorry, do you want to say something? I was just saying, I'm open to any kind of questions or... Um, well, Kevin, you really got me thinking about the uh, pacemaker when you talked about that. That's pretty scary. Uh, to think that a device could be uh, updated remotely through sound or something like that, and really just be wondering what else could be involved if we start just jumping in and a lot of people are like, I just want to do it. I just want to get on whatever high tech things there are. There might be implications of that. And, you know, the, the Tesla cars and things like that. If you start to see those videos and stuff online, it's, it's interesting. So thank you for what you do for Semantech, what Semantech does. You've been very helpful here. Uh, Semantech has actually helped with our tour post and so, some of the Cyber Patriot stuff, stuff that we do here at, uh, at Battlefield High School. So thank you again. It's been very, very helpful. Thank you, Liam. Really appreciate it. Very You've you got in here, and we can also bring it in um, for other events uh, it, it, with the Cyber Patriot and things like that with uh, Professor Drake. So if there's some things you guys want to do, or Mr. Becker, question. Um, I, I know of the uh, the hack that they demonstrated against the automobile, where they did a where they did a uh, remote uh, Wi-Fi uh, uh, compromise, and they were able to break the car. Uh, do you, are you aware of any other um, hacks of, like of that nature where devices like that have actually been demonstratively hacked? I, I will tell you one that had a major impact on traffic. Uh -huh. So, within the nation of Israel, within the city of, I want to say it's Haifa, the, the suburbs where most of the people live, kind of where the, the city's busy in the day and people kind of go at night, they have to go through, it's a, it's a choke point that goes underneath a bridge, and it's a pretty long, like, underground tunnel. So, what happened was, was on a, on a morning during rush hour, the security controls, because it's a fa there's failed open systems, and if there's something buggy, it will report it, but it doesn't repeat flow. But Israel having a lot of security concerns around terrorism, they have set up their tunnels and things as a failed closed system. So if they can't tell if something, like a, something that could detonate has entered, a then they will shut traffic off, and they will clear those cars until that defensive technology is brought back online. So the system went, kind of went wiggy on them for a period of eight minutes. So it impeded traffic, but then it went back online and said, okay, well, some kind of a glitch. The following day, that system closed for a full eight hours. So it created massive secondary and tertiary effects to the economy. You know, think about it. Medical personnel can't go to leave. People at the hospital, there are people, in the, but you know, babies are still being born, and. Uh, important jobs still have to occur, law enforcement, all these, but they, they basically caused the stoppage of traffic flow. And I thought, oh my goodness, you, know, you think about in the DC metro area, 66 to 495, <coughs> the Springfield Interchange, and a few other choke points, you know, if we had these same types of problems, um, you know, in, impacting traffic. So if you also think about it, if, and I, and I, I don't want to sound like too much like a Tom Clancy movie, right, or something, you say, gosh, Kevin's being kind of silly. 
but just some food for thought. If events in the world were to spin out of control, let's say the Korean Peninsula destabilized and actually became a, rather than a 67, 77 year cold war became a hot war, right? Let's say at the same time Iran and Saudi Arabia went to war, at the same time, right? Um, and let's say there was also at the same time a massive blizzard or heat wave or, or a Katrina or Sandy type of event. Perfect storm, right? All these bad things happen. Now imagine if there was a, a consolidated cyber attack. Maybe there's even already staged embedded malware systems and command and control rooted systems. So let's say across the US there was impact to traffic. Uh, let's say with embedded technologies in automobiles, if it caused them to accelerate and the brakes did not work, so you have lots of collision, lights blinking, turn off wastewater treatment processing, uh, power grids, uh, telephony, you know, cellular towers. If, if multiple systems were impacted, how operationally degraded would the United States be <coughs> when the United States needs to pivot and focus on events around the world, um, you know, go, go wheels up for our military to go do things, but if there was all these problems in the U.S., coupled with weather and you know earthquake or something, I mean, so if you think about the perfect storm, cyber and again not to be too much like a like a Clancy novel, but cyber really could be that tipping point to give adversaries time to execute their battle plan and cause the U.S. to sort of be late, late to the fight. If that makes sense. So that to me is like a big picture thing, and even if we kind of um, you think about a, a, a dam, the wall, like it starts to crack and you put the thumbs in the, in the you know, but, but you get your toes in there, but at what point do we as a nation sort of get overrun from a, um, former um, CIA director and former Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, used the phrase, silent Pearl Harbor. And there's also that phrase, you know, death by a thousand cuts too. So is it that one big cyber Pearl Harbor, that one day or that one event, or simply over time, mm -hmm operationally degraded, and also for our economy. You know, if you think about intellectual property being exfiltrated and brought to other countries to their factories, blue, our blueprints, because America is a creative, innovative people. We have been since the founding of our republic. Uh, even going back to the colonial era, like I said about, you know, building curtain textile, and, you know, at that time we were sort of the, the bandits of the day, stealing technology from the, the Brits and, and the Scots. But if, if you think about it, Around the world, there's all these cheap imitations and knockoffs of our, our technology, our clothing, our uh, movies, I mean, all this, our, you know, all of our creative intellectual property. It, it's a slow leak. And that, so we, so we as a nation, we spend a lot of money on research and development, product development, innovation. And then if other parts of the world beat us to market. So they, <coughs> we're both trying to sell to people in uh, Prince William County. But if they beat us to market, even though this US-based company didn't do it. So that, that sort of, um, you know, some But to what Kevin would say, because Symantec is pretty humble, he's here representing Symantec too, with that hat on. Uh, there's a Wired Magazine article that's really good. It talks about Stuxnet, S-T-U-X-N-E-T. And uh, Symantec doesn't wave their flag around too much on it. Symantec was very uh, important in discovering that, and that's one where somebody actually did utilize a vulnerability. And there were several. Zero days, which I video talking about things nobody even knew was a, a vulnerability. <coughs> Several of those were used. Um, and according to the article, my understanding of the article was that uh, it shut down centrifuges for making um, weapons grade um, uh, nuclear materials. So I'd really suggest just Google, you know, Wired Magazine, Stuxnet, Symantec, and it's, it's several pages. It, it really gets into that kill chain and it's exciting. Like a, like a novel. <laughs> Does it so, get to that kind of Carl? It does, thank you. Yeah, if I could just add something about Stuxnet real quick. So at its core, uh, anytime you have a nuclear reactor, it, there's very high temperatures involved, right? So there's cooling with pipes and water and different systems to keep it cool and keep the, the heat contained so that you don't overheat the reactor, which does a lot of destructive things. You have to shut it down, and, and there's a lot of damage. Um, it's sometimes unrecoverable for that reactor. What happened was Stuxnet caused the alerting system saying the, what temperature the, the, the cooling systems were at, it caused them to report in a healthy operating temperature when in fact it was changing the temperature ever so gradually escalating, causing pipes to rupture and break. So when that happened, the, the financial damage to the Iranian reactor operators was prodigious. It actually shut down 
for an extended period of time, their ability to produce any uh, fissile material, you know, the, the uranium and uh, other components that they were working on. Uh, but it's interesting because the Iranian, the Iranian television has, they have their equivalent of like Oprah and th things like that where they have talk shows and, and what have you. So they actually had interviewed some senior Iranian officials on this talk show and they said, yes, you know, we never thought an adversary would come and do something like this to the Iranian people, etc. And they said, but now, you know, fool us once, uh, shame on you, essentially, but you won't fool us again. So now they've, and they admitted this on their this TV program, they have ramped up their cyber defenses to include offensive cyber capabilities. So I remember being at, at a one uh, briefing over in, in Roslyn, uh, it was a corporation Boeing had some guest speakers coming in, and they, were, they actually showed footage with translation of interviews on Iranian television where they're saying, yes, we are building uh, offensive capabilities to be able to attack our adversaries from a cyber perspective. So again, that's the, what the Iranians were saying about themselves, and they specifically called out the United States for that. So just that, I just got to say this, right? Because the, all the stuff I had read uh, posited that Subnet was a state actor, not a hacker group that was behind it. I don't know how you feel about that, but that's a really interesting perspective because that's a very much of an unintended consequence if that were, let's say, for purposes of discussion, the Israelis who, who did the uh, who did the uh, Subnet to have that be the consequence. It is like yeah, a novel. It's like that spy novel. It, it really is one of those exciting. It's it's a page turn. But. So so Richard Clark was uh, part of a, a national security advisor for for both both Democrat and Republican administrations, uh -huh. and he's spoken extensively about uh, Stuxnet and some of the, the downstream ramifications of it, and he coined the phrase weaponized malware. Yeah. And what he said was what Mr. Clark said was Stuxnet was essentially nested if then statements if located in the city of Natanz. Yeah in Iran proceed, if not self-delete the program, if this type of industrial controller device proceed, if not self-delete everything. So it was all these if-thens, and then the final if-thens were to modify temperature and reporting and, and cause that variance, right? So what, so what happened was there were certain reactors in certain parts of the world where they were using um, pirated operating systems, and they were using a 30-day free, free trial. And what the sysadmins would do is every weekday, they would set it to the day prior, and every Monday they come on shift, they'd set it back to Friday, so, so they, or, or whatever the magic day was. So, so that way they could keep that operating system going indefinitely as a pirated copy. That caused Stuxnet to hang. It didn't self-delete nor did it execute. But it basically, they did, they did their own cyber analysis. They go, oh my gosh, and that's how, and then Samantha got involved in, in further identifying it. So that's how Stuxnet got found, it was a little bit by accident. But the other thing, going back to Mr. Clark and the idea of weaponized malware, he said, take those nef that code, that, that attack modality of Stuxnet, nested if-then statements. Imagine if you start swapping out. So not if Natanz, if this, if that. How about this? If in Cleveland, and operating this, and this, then execute it. So boom, boom, boom. That same sort of shell of the code could be, and I'm certain could use it to target the US or one of our any other quick questions? Because we're at the end of our time. All right. Thank you all very much. And thank you, Kevin. And thank Thanks. you, Samantha. For thank you.